Hornet Heaven, Series 1, Episode 1, The Turnaround, Earth Season, 2014-15. Frank Gammon wasn't good company when Watford lost. Over the decades, he'd thrown more teacups than Graham Taylor. He'd kicked more cats than Paul Robinson had kicked wingers. His first wife told him he was impossible to live with. His second and third divorces proved it. After the 4-1 defeat at home to Huddersfield at the end of 2013-14, even his latest cat walked out on him. By then he was a very old man. He'd also become terminally ill. He moved into a hospice. He was treated well, but whenever Watford lost, the staff had to keep the sort of distance opponents used to keep from John Eustace. As Frank declined, Watford improved. They began the 2014-15 season well and looked genuine candidates for promotion to the Premier League. But as Frank contemplated his imminent death, his greatest fear became its timing. He didn't want to die angry after a Watford defeat. A nurse at the hospice once joked that if he did, it wouldn't half make the afterlife miserable for everybody. But Frank didn't believe in an afterlife. He thought it was about as likely as Watford changing their manager in the middle of a promotion campaign. Frank weakened rapidly. After Watford appointed their fourth manager of the season and lost four games on the trot in November 2014, the nurse joked to a colleague that the pearly gates looked like they were in for a right old kicking. In truth, though, Frank wouldn't have had the strength for it. Death finally came to Frank in January 2015. A week earlier, and he'd have gone out on a high. Watford had won their last game 5-0. Unfortunately, at the moment of his passing, Watford were 2-0 down. At first, he didn't notice. Then he discovered he couldn't open his eyes. He couldn't move. He had no sense of his body. His only sensation was the three counties radio commentary in his ears. This was it. He was slipping away. He swore. It wasn't meant to be this way. His only connection with the world was hearing co-commentator Derek Payne complain that the opposition striker had the beating of the Watford defenders. Before today... Frank had never considered whose voice he'd like to be the last he ever heard. Now, he knew it wasn't Derek Payne's. Frank swore again, in anger as well as panic. Dying in the middle of a match was a torture in itself. But Watford were losing. He shouted and shouted. No one at the hospice heard. As his life force ebbed away, the final thing Frank Gammon heard on earth was John Marks summarising a truly disastrous first half. If you didn't hear the half-time whistle, you probably heard the boos here at Vicarage Road. 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 Everything went blindingly white. He found himself in a snowy mist. Then the mist cleared to a dreary half-light. He recognised immediately where he was. He saw rotting fences, crumbling garages, twisted brambles. He was standing on Occupation Road behind the newly built Sir Elton John stand. He swore, in confusion this time, what the hell was he doing at the stadium? he just died, hadn't he? He looked and listened. He guessed he was in the afterlife somehow. 
but it was odd. There was no half-time hubbub coming from inside the stadium. No half-arsed penalty shootout commentary. Nothing. He was alone in a silent twilight. The place felt like a miserable grey limbo. Just what life must have felt like for Luton fans in the conference, he thought. This was no place to spend eternity, Frank decided. He needed to get back to the hospice somehow, so he could die after a Watford victory. He started to look for the way out. No point hanging round here, mate, he heard a voice say. Frank turned. He saw a steward in a high-vis jacket. He reckoned he must be in hell, not limbo, if stewards were involved. How do I get back to where I was? Frank asked tersely. The steward rolled his eyes. Here we go. First thing everyone asks. Frank snapped back. Listen, pal, I died at the wrong moment, all right. Yep, that's what they all say. If this isn't the best of all possible places you could end up, the steward said. Frank glanced at the rusting corrugated iron, the cracked brickwork. It really didn't look like the best of all possible places. But you said there's no point hanging round here, he said. There isn't, mate, the steward said. Not here, but if you walk to the top of the road. Frank looked up the slope towards the junction with Vicarage Road. Throughout his time as a Watford fan, the Red Lion pub had always stood there. Now, instead, a golden glow was rising into the sky. Frank followed the steward up Occupation Road. The half-light became brighter, but he couldn't help thinking back to the boos he'd heard on the commentary. The more he thought, the more he began to get in a stew, the way he always did when Watford lost. Nil too, he said and swore. Uh-oh, said the steward. Spoilers. At home, he said, and swore again. Frank was in such a funk that he didn't notice an ancient-looking turnstile in the wall behind the new stand. The steward tried to cheer things up by getting Frank to focus on the positive aspects of his situation. Anyway, mate, how are you feeling physically? Frank noticed how easily he was walking. Physically, he felt great. For the first time in two years, his body felt full of energy and possibility. He felt like Machia Vidra lurking on a defender's shoulder, ready to sprint through on goal. But he couldn't focus on any of that right now. Against the bottom team! he said, and swore worse than ever. Soon, they passed the dumped remnants of a shabby red porter cabin. Its walls had been stacked flat on the gravel verge. Piled on top was a discarded square sign that said, The Bill Mainwood Program Hut. Frank guessed someone was building a bonfire to symbolise Watford's promotion hopes going up in flames. Then he looked up and stopped in his tracks. The building that had replaced the Red Lion was a futuristic construction. Glass and steel with shiny curves and sharp angles. Golden light poured from every window was magnificent. Magnificent in a way Neil Price's reopening of the pub had never quite managed. Frank asked what the building was. 
the steward pointed out the sign above the door. In yellow capitals it said, Hornet Heaven. Well, I guess it's catchier than the yellow and red lion, Frank muttered. The idea that Frank thought the building was still a pub made the steward laugh. You really don't get it, mate, do you? Frank shrugged. He guessed he didn't. Mate, you've died and gone to heaven. And not just any heaven. A paradise just for Watford fans. Hornet heaven. This is the main entrance. Frank shrugged again. OK, he got the idea. But what was it going to be like? So far, he hadn't been impressed. The steward put his arm around Frank's shoulder. You'll be happy here. Frank rubbed his knuckles. He probably shouldn't have chinned the guy, but he hated people promising him he'd be happy when they couldn't control what made him unhappy. He'd supported Watford since the start of the 1968-69 season. Since then, he'd been unhappy exactly 836 times if you counted league and both main cups. No one had been able to prevent that. He also probably shouldn't have shouted at the retreating steward or called him a name by putting two bad words together to come up with a brand new, far worse word. But he couldn't stand anyone reassuring him that he'd be happy. Supporting Watford all his life hadn't made him a happy person, so it was unlikely to make him one after he'd died. He made his way through the doors of the building. He'd judge Hornet Heaven for himself. Frank found himself in a fabulously bright atrium, spacious and uncluttered. It was beautiful. Row upon row of wooden shelving stretched away as far as the eye could see. Frank went over to the shelves. He found they were stocked with Watford programmes, home and away, season after season. Whose idea of heaven is a programme library? Frank said out loud. He managed not to swear. He felt a presence at his shoulder. He turned and saw a kindly looking old man with spectacles. Hello, I'm Bill Mainwood, the old man said. I look after the programmes here. Frank wasn't a fan of programmes. He'd never seen the point of shelling out good money for a pre-printed list of names he'd have to change with a biro. Why bother, pal? Who gives a toss about programmes? he asked. Bill smiled. Oh, I think you'll be very happy with these. Frank had a policy of not hitting people who wore glasses. Instead, he called Bill the most obscene name he knew. The surprise in Bill's eyes was magnified through his glasses. Well, he flustered, I think we'd better get on with your orientation. Come and sit over here. Frank and Bill sat on stylish yellow leather armchairs at the end of a row of programmes. Bill began what sounded like a well-rehearsed spiel. You're now in Hornet Heaven, the resting place for Watford fans in the afterlife. You'll be... He corrected himself. Most people are happy here. Blissfully happy, Frank shrugged, non-committal. What makes them happy is that they can carry on watching Watford matches even after they've passed away. 
It turns out we're not just Watford till we die. We're Watford for all eternity. Bill paused and removed his glasses. At this point, during orientations, as people took on board the concept of never missing another Watford match ever again for the rest of time, they usually welled up with tears of joy and hugged him. And Bill didn't want to go through eternity with broken spectacles. Frank, though, didn't well up. He wasn't ready to hug anybody. He'd endured Watford defeats for 46 years. Now he was going to have to endure them until the end of time. Was this meant to make him happy? As a case in point, Watford were currently losing 2-0. At home, against the bottom team. How was this the stuff of eternal bliss? The people in heaven were just a bunch of happy clappers, he thought to himself. He got out of his chair and headed for the exit. Outside the door, Frank felt a hand on his shoulder. Expecting the steward, he turned and raised a fist, ready to strike out. Then he saw a face he recognised. He lowered his fist. He straightened. He felt a wave of deference pass through his body, as if he were a pack dog in the presence of its leader. At first, he couldn't put a name to the face. Then he remembered. He'd seen a younger version of the face in photographs. Photographs of genuine Watford legends. It couldn't be, could it? Frank had read so much about him, but had become a Watford fan too late to see him play. He'd always wanted to see him, to meet him, to understand what was so great about him. Was this actually him? It was. It was the big fella. Bill Mainwood had his glasses back on. Thanks, Cliff, he called out. Frank sat back down onto the yellow leather armchair and watched Cliff Holton head off to the program shelves. Even though the man had died nearly twenty years ago, he had an incredible aura. Something about him made you feel a compulsion to do exactly what he wanted. Frank felt awestruck. He tuned in to Bill again. The old man was explaining how Hornet Heaven worked. As soon as a match finishes on Earth, the program arrives here. You help yourself from the shelves, go back out onto Occupation Road and go through the ancient turnstile in the stadium wall. You'll find yourself wherever the match took place in the crowd with everyone who was actually at the match in the real world. It's not like watching on telly. You can move around and get the whole experience. The sights, the sounds, the smells, all the emotions. It's pure rapture. Frank liked the sound of it. But he still didn't like being told what was going to make him happy. He didn't feel quite so aggressive about it now, though. He was feeling the big fella's influence. Yeah, but my mate saw us lose at Huddersfield two Saturdays ago, pal. He did use some of the word rapture to describe it, but it had a letter C in front of it. If Evan includes games like that, I don't see anything to write home about. But this is your home now, and we've got a great group, as Malky used to say. A great community, as GT used to say. Everyone's a fan, or former player. To be fair, Frank did like the idea of a heaven exclusively for Watford fans. At least it meant his three ex-wives wouldn't be around to walk out on him again. And then, of course, Bill continued, 
there's what you can do between matches. For Frank, on earth, the days between defeats had largely consisted of drinking heavily and kicking things. It would be good, he thought, if heaven could offer an improvement on this. The reason we keep all the programmes on the shelves is so that you can go and watch any Watford match in history whenever you want. Frank frowned. Wait. You're saying I can go to any match Watford have ever played? Yup. At any time. With 134 seasons to choose from, Bill said. Well, he added, apart from 1917-18, when we played no games at all. Frank tried to contemplate this. The enormity of it defeated him. Bill leaned forward and put his hand on Frank's arm. I think it could be very beneficial for you, Bill said. Frank didn't immediately pull his arm away. There was something avuncular about Bill. Frank was warming to him. You see, Bill said, if we lose a match in the land of the living, you can cheer yourself up straight away by going to watch a historic game where we gave a team a right old stuffing. You just come back here, pick up the programme and go. For some reason, a 4 nil away win in October 1997 popped into Frank's head. The mere thought made him feel a little bit better already. Going to see that again would wipe away the misery of something like today's inevitable defeat. He looked at Bill's kind smile and nodded. Maybe this place wasn't going to be so bad after all. Frank sat and chatted to Bill. They found plenty of great games they'd both been at, either in the flesh or in the plasma. For almost an hour, memories of wonderful Watford wins made Frank feel warm and fuzzy. Then a shout went up. Programs in! Frank's warmth and fuzziness evaporated. Now he had to confront Watford losing again. I don't want to go, he said. Bill put his hand on Frank's arm again. Do you know how many victories you've got to choose from when we get back? These shelves contain exactly 1,980 league and cup victories since the club took the name Watford in 1898 up to and including last week's win over Charlton. I think you'll find that's plenty. Frank nodded and smiled. They collected a couple of the new programmes and left the atrium for the match. Occupation Road was busy. Some people were wearing dark Victorian suits from the 1890s. Others were wearing garish replica shirts from a hundred years later. Frank saw a man who he thought looked a bit like Mike Keane, Watford's manager from the mid-1970s, or what Mike Keane must have looked like when he'd aged. Everyone was heading for the ancient turnstile. A man in a 1985-86 away top called out cheerily, can't wait for this one, Bill. After last week's five, I reckon we'll get six or seven. Frank wanted to put the man right, but he bit his tongue. Another man, in 1920s casual wear, was studying the programme as he walked. This lot have only won three games all season. None away from home. They're terrible. We'll run up a cricket score. Frank felt his anger rising. He didn't need to hear this. A man in his seventies with short wavy hair and a Scottish accent chipped in. They were decent in my playing days. Won the FA Cup in 1953. 
Frank glanced at the man, but didn't recognise Jimmy Bowie, a canny inside forward who played his final game for Watford on Boxing Day 1955. Frank felt it helped a little to hear the opposition talked up like this. They're utter crap now, though, Jimmy Bowie added. They joined a queue to go through the ancient turnstile. Frank still had his doubts, though. He already knew the half-time score. He'd only come out angry at full-time. He shouldn't go in. He'd just started living in a new community. He didn't want to prove he was impossible to live with on his very first day. And what would he gain? There was simply no point watching what happened in the second half of Watford versus Blackpool on the 24th of January 2015. It wasn't as if the second half was going to go down in history. He excused himself to Bill and stepped out of the queue. Jimmy Bowie emerged from the ancient turnstile and let out a shriek of joy. Seven two! he yelled. Seven bloody two! Cliff Holton walked back towards the atrium, beaming with happiness. Everyone who saw him found themselves beaming even more than they'd been beaming already. Mike Keane started up a chant on Occupation Road. Egalo, oh, always believe in your soul. Everyone joined in. Generations of Watford fans from 1881 to 2015 sang at the tops of their voices. Afterwards, a boy who died in 1908 started a song about Troy Deeney, Watford's number nine. Everyone belted that one out too. No one could quite believe what they'd seen. Within eight minutes of the second half, Watford had come back from 2-0 down to 2-2. A minute later, they were in the lead, 3-2. After that, they kept scoring like clockwork. Four, five, six, seven. No one had seen anything like it. Someone said it was the best second half in living memory. Someone else went further. They said it was the best second half in non-living memory too. Everyone who'd been at the match was very, very happy. No one would have missed it for the world. The jubilant chanting on Occupation Road continued. Shortly, Bill emerged from the ancient turnstile. Behind him was Frank. Frank had a very, very big smile on his face. He stopped Bill and hugged him. Bill quickly removed his glasses to be on the safe side. Thanks for insisting I went. I owe you, pal. Frank said. Frank and Bill went straight back through the turnstile again. They sat in the rookery end and re-watched the match against Blackpool in its entirety. Frank went wild again when Odia Nikhalo scored his fourth to make it seven. Then he sat down and said, Horny heaven is great, pal. He swore this time in happiness. When I was listening to the commentary and we reached half-time 2 nil down, he said to Bill, I thought it was the end of the world. To be fair, it was. Your world, anyway. What I mean is, I used to think it was the end of the world every time we lost. Now, though, I can see the bigger picture. That was our 1,981st win. How many have we ever lost? 
not quite as many. Only 1,891, Bill said. Frank nodded and reflected quietly. Ten minutes later, they watched Troy Deeney walk towards them to applaud Watford fans both living and, unknown to Troy, dead. Bill said, You know, Frank, this will always be one of those I was there games for Watford fans. Frank nodded. He thought back to how earlier in the day he'd been lying in pain on his hospice bed with no chance of being at Vicarage Road. But now he was here. His eyes welled up. Bill hadn't been wrong with all that stuff he'd been saying about making Watford fans happy. So, Bill said, as they made their way back to the ancient turnstile. Do you need to go to a game where we stuff someone, just to cheer you up? Frank felt no need at all. But he did have a taste for something. What other great comeback victories have you got? He asked. Oh, now you're talking, Bill said. How about Bolton at home? Three nil down with twenty minutes to go. Gary Porter hat trick four three win. Bill purred. I know exactly where that is on the shelves. Let's go. As they emerged onto Occupation Road, Frank looked up at the amazing yellow building and the Hornet Heaven sign. He reckoned he could get used to this. End of episode one. The next story from Hornet Heaven will be episode two, We Was Robbed. To find out more, go to hornetheaven.com. Hornet Heaven was created and written by Watford fan Ollie Wicken. It was read by Watford fan Colin Mace. It was produced by Watford fan John Mooney. Music by Watford fans Steve Joy and Jeff Wicken.